بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسعدني ان ارحب بكم في الجلسه الثالثه I'm pleased to welcome you to the third and last session of this uh, first day where we'll talk about the social transformations and we thank the center for uh, organizing this event the development and uh, making the changes and it uh, studies that through four papers the second element is the role the uh, language change and uh, its effect on Arabic language. Maran Kamrava, Ali Abdurraouf, his colleague Adil Ali couldn't come, Dania Zafar and Dr. Qasim Shaban. The first paper from urban spaces to global cities Assessing the new port cities of the Gulf by Dr. Mehran Kamrava. He is from uh, Georgetown University in Qatar. He has the PhD from Cambridge and has uh, wide expertise. in security in the Persian Gulf. Now, is it Persian or Arab, Arabian? That's a different question. <laughs> you have 15 minutes. Uh, thank you. Let me start by thanking the Doha Institute and the Arab Center for Policy and Research for this honor. I've been here a number of years uh, and have had the honor of presenting at this conference, and uh, it's uh, always a, a, a terrific honor to be here. Um, I, uh, in the remaining uh, 30 minutes or so that I have with you, I wanted to very quickly uh, talk about the, um, uh, the cities that uh, we see around us. And uh, one of the questions that um, is often asked is, what do these cities mean? Uh, Doha, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. And in fact, on the way here, for the local ones, or for those of you who've been around, I just drove through Lusail, which um, is a city literally being built. It's a city uh, that is being built uh, into the sea, into the sky, and of course in the, into the desert. And so in this sense, what I have tried to do is to make sense of these urban spaces that are growing up and down the Gulf. And I wanna, I've been asking myself for the last several years, uh, what do these cities mean? What do they signify and what is their significance? So I wanna share with you some thoughts, some preliminary thoughts that I've been um, uh, thinking through and uh, just uh, kind of seeing whether or not these cities, um, what they mean both for themselves, in themselves, and in the context of the region and beyond the region globally. And one of the things that I realized is that uh, uh, one of the questions that I ask myself is do these cities work? Do they work? And to uh, understand and answer this question, whether or not these cities work, Doha, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi, are they white elephants? Are they empty shells? Or are they actual cities? I thought that it would be best to look at it from three perspectives. Look at these cities at the global level, at uh, the regional level, and as, uh, uh, as the, uh, at a global level. What do these cities mean locally uh, to the people who live there? What do they mean regionally in terms of uh, uh, five-hour flight radius, let's say from, for example, Rabat uh, uh, in the west to um, New Delhi or uh, cities in India in the east, and, uh, and then, of course, in relation to uh, the rest of the world. Are they global cities or not? And um, 
uh, this is what I, what I think. In terms of whether or not they work, yes, they do. They're livable cities for people who live there. And in a minute, I'll, I'll elaborate on what I mean, what I mean by that. Where, but when we look at the significance of the cities regionally, uh, the verdict is a little mixed. They are in many ways and in many respects regional hubs. They're regional hubs for a number of sectors and segments, but we cannot yet say they are regional capitals. You might remember that a couple of years ago this was a very hot discussion whether or not the Gulf region has emerged as the new capital of the Middle East. And the jury is uh, a little less decided on whether or not these are global cities. I maintain that if we apply a definition of a global city that is common and commonly accepted, uh, by all accounts, really Dubai might come closest. And Doha and Abu Dhabi have uh, some ways to go. So let me elaborate on this very quickly, beginning with whether or not they are um, livable spaces. First. Uh, the example of Lucille that I mentioned, and for those of you who are from Oman or Kuwait, there are other examples. We know that there's been tremendous urban growth in recent years. There's been this hyper-urbanism that, uh, that has expanded radically and rapidly. When I first came here 11 years ago, I had buildings as, as landmarks for direction to find my way from one place to another. And of course, quickly I realized that you couldn't do that. Now this hyper-urbanism is no longer, at least after the 1980s, driven by urban planning. Instead, in fact, it's driven by commercial interests. It's driven by commercial interests that are geared at consumers. This is geared at pr predominantly Western consumers attracting expats, Western expats, but also, of course, making these cities attractive to local populations, making these cities attractive to the national population. And of course, this commercial endeavor, the consumerism and the hyper growth is being led by members that are either part of the ruling family or are in close commercial and economic alliance with the ruling family. Probably the most, um, uh, the best example of the uh, urban planner uh, is uh, the ruler of Dubai, for whom Dubai is growing rapidly and his own commercial interests are vested in it. And I think if you look outside of Dubai, you will see examples again and again of people either within the ruling inner circle or with extremely close ties uh, with the ruling family in which th they are driving commercial planning. And in fact, the planning department in the city, in the municipality, which used to be extremely consequential into the 1980s, is no longer active and it's instead this uh, liberal consumerism uh, aimed at a Western audience, places like Villaggio, The Pearl, uh, Landmark, these names of course are very telling. These are commercially driven and um, it is part of a ruling bargain in which uh, either members of the ruling family or the merchant classes closely tied to the ruling family are benefiting from this uh, urban development. Now, um, uh, continuing with the contemporary Gulf city, let me just show you a quick snapshot of what uh, the, a typical Gulf city looks like. This could be a map of either Doha or Kuwait city or Dubai, where we have the center in gray and around it the new city has grown. This map incidentally uh, is readily available. I didn't put the source here, but it's uh, from a uh, from a famous book by Florian Wheatman on Doha. And uh, so that uh, you see the um, reclaimed land. Um, uh, this reclaimed development is again part of this um, commercially driven urban development, which in many ways those in the ruling inner circle benefit from. You have the, the commercial business district in red, the suburbs, 
and of course uh, around it is the transitional zone in which you have uh, both co residences as well as small businesses and other parts. And then uh, beginning in the 1990s, we have towers. And these towers, again, are those prime examples of this commercially driven. They're, they have nothing to do with the local uh, architecture, nothing to do with local history, but they're appealing, they're glitzy, they look nice, and, and of course, there's a lot of money to be made in building them, and you see that those are on the edges uh, of the city, oftentimes in areas that have been uh, reclaimed. So this is a typical Gulf city and, and what, it, uh, what it looks like. Now, in terms of livable spaces, uh, these are livable spaces, particularly for the people who live there. The population of these cities, in the broadest terms, can be divided into two groups. First, of course, you have nationals, uh, which p are part of a ruling bargain, to, uh, which the state really takes care of. And then, of course, you have the expats. And we know that there are, again, at the broadest level, we have three categories of expatriates. These categories are problematic, they're fluid, they're changeable, but we have the so-called skilled, um, high-income expats, many of whom live in either the suburbs or in the towers. We have the middle classes uh, that are oftentimes employed in uh, services sector, and of course there are the uh, unskilled or uh, low-skilled uh, expats. Now, for all of these, the, the what in local parlance, what in everyday parlance is called migrant labor, although uh, all the expats are migrant workers, technically. So for all of these categories, whether nationals or expats, or uh, whether high-skilled, low-skilled, um, or um, semi-skilled, these cities work. They are livable spaces. This is not necessarily talking about their working conditions. This is talking about their living conditions. And in fact, there have been studies done uh, by uh, someone uh, he, uh, who's also involved here at the uh, Doha Institute and uh, by colleagues at uh, Qatar University that have specifically asked people about their living conditions. And without exception, all categories of expatriates report that their living conditions have improved compared to what they were in their home countries when they moved here whether you are unskilled and live in a room with 20 other uh, migrant workers, or you are part of a high-income expat family that lives in a high-rise, everybody reports that their living conditions have actually improved to what they were, whether it is in terms of safety or hygiene or living standards or uh, the amenities at their disposal. So, uh, in one way or another, these cities work. Now, let's look at them at the regional level. Are these regional, uh, what do these cities mean in terms of the Middle East and South Asia? Uh, and, and when I talk about the region, again, I'm not just talking about the Middle East, but think about East as well, the, the East. Now, you know that in 2013, there was a robust scholarly debate as to whether or not these cities are the new capitals of the Middle East. This was started by Sultan al Qasimi uh, in Dubai, and he said these are the new capitals. And the reaction was ferocious to Sultan al Qasimi's uh, discussion of these uh, cities as the new capitals. And someone said uh, quite rudely, one Western or, or one Arab scholar in the West said, just because you have a preponderance of Lebanese singers doesn't mean you're the new capital of the Middle East. Now, these cities may not necessarily be regional capitals, but if we look, they're actually regional hubs. Now, I don't know if you can see, uh, because it's, uh, I don't know if you can see all the categories, but if we look at science and culture, logistics, and services, the three broad categories of science and culture, logistics and services, we see that there are indeed areas 
in which these cities are regional hubs when it comes to transportation. Of course, they're regional hubs. When it comes to medical tourism, Dubai is a regional hub. When it comes to banking and finance, they're regional hubs. None of the traditional regional capitals, Cairo, uh, of course, unfortunately, Damascus and Baghdad, you can't talk about them as regional capitals anymore, but none of them compare, whereas in many areas, these uh, cities compare in so far as being regional capitals are concerned. And of course, universities, we see that Doha and Abu Dhabi have uh, again emerged as regional capital in terms of museums, air transport, and again, uh, banking and uh, finance. Now, last, let's see if these are global cities. Uh, are these indeed global cities or are they more accurately aspiring global cities? Are they cities that are global? And uh, let's begin with a definition of a global city. There's a lot of definitions uh, of a global city that are out there. I'll just share with you what is probably the most common definition, which, is, uh, which was offered by Saskia Sassen. And uh, Saskia Sassen sees three definitions or three criteria for a city to be global. First, they are the command points in the organization of a global economy. Now, on that score, these cities probably fit, Doha, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. But they're also key locations and marketplaces for leading industries uh, of the current period, whatever the industry is in that current period, and finance and specialized services and firms. Now, there we uh, don't necessarily see the second criteria applying to uh, Doha, for example, in many respects. And what really doesn't apply is global cities being centers of production. Doha is not a center of production. Abu Dhabi is not a center of production. You, can, you might argue that Dubai is a center of production uh, in some respects, but certainly uh, Doha and Abu Dhabi have a long way go. So in terms of whether or not these cities are aspiring, uh, and are they global cities? I think we can argue that certainly Dubai is a global city in some respects, but when it comes to Abu Dhabi and uh, uh, Doha, those are best aspiring cities. So let me end with the early question, the first question that I started with. I, I know I said I I'm going to end. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, again, at the local level, these are livable spaces. At the re as, as regional hubs, they are hubs but not capitals uh, in most respects but not all aspects of, uh, of their functions. And in terms of global cities, they're really aspiring rather than actual global cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mehran. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation. Uh, the next uh, speaker, second speaker, Dr. Ali Abdraouf. Uh, his paper is, is about the uh, modern uh, GCC uh, uh, city from uh, the uh, particular to the uh, general. He's a university professor, architect. He's also coordinator of a capability built in, uh, in Qatar. Professor in HABQ University in uh, Qatar. His uh, research is uh, focused uh, on uh, modern GCC uh, cities and also the vacuum uh, in uh, Arab Spring cities. Uh, he has uh, a number of uh, publications. The floor is yours. You have. Sharaf Kabirli and Akun in the panel Mutamayez Waidan. Uh, the speakers and among uh, the panelists and a big guest uh, here at the uh, Arab Center for Research and uh, Policy Studies. Uh, like uh, to thank uh, also my colleague uh, for her uh, contribution. Can you please uh, get keep cl closer to the microphone? The uh, Scientific uh, Commission uh, skipped a part. Uh, 
of uh, the topic and uh, that made me sad uh, but uh, at the end of the day I found out that they uh, were right to do that uh, so how can we have a title which is uh, beyond uh, the identity so please bear with me I'm not gonna talk about the identity but uh, beyond uh, the identity we want to go outside the frame uh, of uh, the emotional uh, dimension of shaping identity especially the uh, orientalistic dimension I'm very uh, careful also to go out uh, the prototype uh, outside of the prototype or, uh, or uh, stereotype of the GCC society uh, the richer society and the best uh, description we can use uh, for the modern GCC city is uh, an explored uh, city, a moving city, uh, an evolving, uh, developing uh, city every day. And uh, these cities uh, have uh, a historical depth, uh, and uh, well, we uh, look back uh, how they uh, were uh, established uh, before they were fisher uh, villages uh, and uh, of course uh, they are very much uh, related uh, to uh, historical and uh, social uh, uh, values. There is a narrative uh, which is uh, uh, describing uh, the development uh, of these uh, cities. Uh, Abdurrahman Munayef uh, talks about the depth uh, of the social and financial and economic uh, change and how the city in a very short time uh, uh, changed a lot uh, and this uh, brings us uh, to a question was the GCC society able to move and change uh, from uh, a fishing society into an oil based uh, society oil based revenue society and uh, a uh, society which is uh, characterized by the uh, financial dimension he further speaks about uh, uh, the activity, the high activity of uh, uh, GCC societies and GCC countries. There was another uh, version of the event. Uh, it's a novel called uh, Tsunami, and this is uh, a diagnostic of, uh, or a sad diagnostic of the situation of uh, GCC area. In the first uh, pages, this novel. Uh, provides a flashback uh, of uh, the GCC area in 2195, which means uh, after more than 100 years from now, the novel starts uh, describing uh, a painful situation. The uh, GCC uh, citizens uh, stand uh, a, in a queue waiting uh, for their turn to get a visa to travel to Bangladesh uh, to work uh, as uh, drivers. Uh, so the question, are we ready for the post-oil uh, era after oil vanishes or disappears? Uh, what are our options and our alternatives? Uh, are we going to allow our citizens uh, to queue up in front of the uh, embassy of Bangladesh to wait for a visa so I think that uh, the post uh, era uh, the post uh, oil era is something uh, we uh, already see and uh, we see uh, that the uh, oil prices collapse and this is already an index uh, signal that we need to do something uh, let us look what technology is doing the first uh, uh, solar uh, plane solar energy plane and it uh, had already its uh, first uh, trip uh, from Muscat, uh, from Abu Dhabi to Muscat. Uh, it took about uh, six hours, but uh, we believe in the power of technology. But uh, after five or ten years, uh, we might have like uh, half, a, half an hour or one hour, and that will be similar to Qatar Airways or to any other carrier. So let's say. Uh, go back again to the post uh, oil era this is something uh, which has become a reality and there is a need uh, for an effort uh, to uh, look uh, at the post uh, oil era in these uh, cities so we talk here about uh, a multi-dimensional battle what's gonna be the future 
of uh, GCC series, uh, I think that there is an unclear identity. Uh, what do we mean by identity actually? Global, Islamic, Arabic, uh, GCC identity. Which kind of identity do we want? And also the oil uh, revenue which is shrinking tremendously and also there are a lot of signals and questions uh, that we see everywhere in the GCC series uh, the old uh, centers uh, are decreasing uh, there is a big uh, contradiction in expressing uh, identity and also the relationship between the human being uh, and uh, his environment uh, we have an increase in the part of the population which is uh, uh, living here only uh, for a short time uh, and uh, we talk about the uh, GCC area as a homogeneous area but uh, we forget that there are differences uh, f even between villages uh, cultural differences social differences and disparities so we cannot uh, deal with the GCC area as a one unit uh, also our spaces uh, turned out to be uh, areas of uh, towers and gated uh, communities uh, GCC cities uh, are also characterized uh, by a special phenomenon which is uh, uh, punishment. Uh, when they build uh, towers, we say it's not uh, suitable. When they're building a museum, it's not uh, convenient. Uh, when they're uh, building universities, we'll tell them you don't have the will uh, to bring about uh, an educational uh, revolution. So the GCC area is always uh, confronted to a wave of uh, criticism without having uh, the necessary alternative. Uh, the map uh, in front of you has two parts. Uh, this is Doha in 1937-1940. This is uh, the Doha which is in this uh, square uh, in white. So this is uh, the level of uh, development uh, of uh, development of this city in 60 or 70 years. This is unprecedented. This is another area. If you know uh, Doha very well, this is the area of uh, uh, Sheraton. And uh, within two to three decades, uh, we witnessed a huge uh, development. This uh, increase in development uh, makes us uh, uh, make uh, a stop uh, and uh, um, think uh, deeply there was uh, a quick uh, wave of construction. Uh, are we moving in the right uh, direction? Th is, does this uh, development uh, uh, reflect uh, our needs uh, in the studies uh, we conducted? I conducted with uh, Hadil. Uh, we noticed uh, in the last uh, uh, decade uh, we found uh, three paradigms. Uh, the first one uh, The first one uh, is uh, trying to follow the Dubai example. The second uh, is uh, uh, looking for uh, sustainable development without getting really in depth of uh, uh, development. Uh, so it's and the third uh, issue, the third paradigm is uh, the transformation from uh, uh, clientelism economy to knowledge-based uh, economy. So Dubai uh, developed uh, tremendously because uh, there was uh, an aspiration uh, to uh, go for a huge uh, real estate uh, development and uh, investment uh, and the city is using its uh, uh, real estate uh, power to have influence outside uh, Dubai. But the danger of uh, Dubai's uh, example actually uh, uh, established this uh, big uh, lie and uh, instead uh, of uh, posing the right questions the cities started uh, uh, competing to be like Dubai uh, and uh, on the eve uh, of uh, the inauguration of uh, uh, Dubai Burj or uh, Burj Khalifa, Bur uh, Khalifa Tower, uh, Al-Walid ibn Talal said uh, that uh, he wants uh, to build uh, something uh, higher And uh, some uh, 
election candidates uh, said uh, if you uh, elect me i'm gonna choose uh, your uh, change your city and make it like uh, dubai so dubai has become an example of uh, modernity and an example of uh, uh, development uh, so when we compare uh, the different uh, campaigns uh, for comparing all these uh, elements. So you see the difference between the uh, pictures uh, on the left side uh, and those on the right side. Uh, moving from uh, white and uh, uh, black, uh, this means here, as you can see, the comeback of uh, the fishermen after a long time of diving. Uh, you see the sensitivity of uh, the relation between the cities and uh, the uh, golf uh, and here on the other side the colorful uh, pictures uh, reflect uh, the culture of uh, consumption and here after uh, we fall into in a crisis the same experts uh, and specialists uh, who advise us uh, to build uh, towers uh, they are uh, laughing at us uh, after the uh, uh, consequences of the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, there is also another problem also, especially in the last uh, year, uh, the collapse uh, of the collective uh, spirit uh, and uh, the domination of uh, individualism, especially after the Arab Spring. I think this is uh, something international uh, to destroy collective uh, space uh, or uh, public space, uh, which is actually the foundation through which uh, society can express uh, uh, themselves. Uh. And the Sometimes uh, we see uh, a country which is actually one of the founding uh, uh, powers uh, of the GCC uh, uh, Council becomes uh, an enemy for some of the neighboring countries. So actually, we need to go beyond uh, this uh, situation and we need to go back uh, to reality. We cannot uh, have uh, a minister Minister for uh, Tolerance uh, and Minister for uh, Happiness. Uh, at the same time, you have a researcher who was uh, sentenced uh, for a uh, uh, life imprisonment, uh, and afterwards, uh, there was an amnesty uh, within a very short time. So, how can this uh, uh, be in conformity with the uh, Ministry of uh, tolerance and the ministry of uh, happiness also our identity our islamic identity has undergone uh, a uh, difficult uh, test uh, the um, embassy of uh, usa was uh, transferred uh, to jerusalem and uh, the reaction was not uh, uh, as expected uh, so we lost uh, a lot of uh, our uh, values. Uh, the question, do we still have the same Islamic identity? Apart from that, there are a lot of uh, concerns uh, domestically here in the GCC area who are always uh, in a kind uh, of uh, uh, domestic uh, struggle. Uh, shall we accept uh, the other or no? Shall we accept uh, X pact or no? As long as this battle is still going on, there will never be a stability at the level of uh, identity and the depth uh, we need to see. Uh, we see uh, a lot of uh, caricatures uh, portraying the uh, uh, labor and the expats uh, as a threat uh, and that uh, they are uh, uh, draining the uh, wealth uh, and uh, richness of the countries uh, of the GCC area. The notion of uh, sustainable development uh, should go beyond uh, environmental uh, dimensions and uh, should go to uh, social dimensions uh, the beautiful uh, views uh, and the beautiful areas uh, different uh, expats are residing uh, is only one example identity might turn out to be a trap if we don't know how to deal with it because i think uh, that identity is our our, our biggest uh, problem is that we look at uh, identity as a product and not as a process. Uh, it's an operation what 
what's going on actually in GCC uh, cities is uh, uh, something we need to add to this uh, identity. And the other thing is uh, the transformation into uh, a knowledge econo based economy. And this is, uh, of course, uh, changing uh, the definition of uh, identity. Uh, and the creative uh, class uh, does not care about uh, the its uh, place of birth, uh, but it cares more about the uh, environment uh, which is uh, encouraging it for production and also urbanization. And this is uh, actually uh, the topic of my last uh, or recent uh, book, uh, the new urbanization should strike a balance uh, between uh, tradition and uh, modernity. The urbanization of the post-oil era should be uh, uh, friendly to the human being and should take into consideration the uh, civilizational dimension and also the identity should be uh, related to all uh, historical eras uh, also everything we are doing in Doha all these study centers uh, and among them also the center in which we are now is uh, an added value to this uh, city and also uh, building uh, different uh, cultural institutions uh, and uh, museums uh, the question we need to pose how can we reach uh, um, a productive interaction between the human being and all these uh, cultural institutions. The same applies to the new uh, museum and also the uh, social uh, texture and structure and the social, the strength of this social texture is very important. Uh, to conclude this uh, presentation, I want to uh, provide you the following thought. We need to go beyond uh, the uh, identity and defining the identity. We need to go beyond the uh, the identity and uh, what are the uh, options uh, and uh, alternatives. Uh, we need to talk about the uh, multi-facial uh, uh, cultures. Thank you. I enjoyed uh, personally this uh, presentation, the third paper. Pre and post oil discovery, Gulf merchant families, and institutional development. She worked in defense, National Defense University about the Middle East, and she was an economic researcher. And she published many studies and papers and uh, contributed in uh, writing a book. Sorry. Yes, I guess since they already call me doctora, there's no reason to graduate. Um, thank you, doctora, uh, for the kind introduction. I had the chance to moderate her, her presentation in Washington, and now she's moderating mine. Uh, I didn't set an alarm for hers, though. <laughs> um, I also wanted to take the chance to thank uh, the Arab Center for the invitation to a much-needed, thought-provoking forum on the Gulf region. The emergence of the Gulf's rentier economies coincided with a process of state formation that, since their inception, has caused the Gulf states to have certain distributive characteristics. This pathway of development has caused a stickiness of certain institutional arrangements that were crystallized at the critical juncture of the shift from the pre-oil era to the post-oil era. The question that I would like to address today is, how has the strength or weakness of merchant coalitions during the pre-oil era in Kuwait, Bahrain, and Qatar affected the trajectory of institutional development? One critical period that led up to the discovery of oil is the pearl trading era before the 1930s. It set important precedents for development pathways in the Gulf for two reasons. First, the interplay between the merchants and the state placed the development trajectories of critical state institutions. Second, the period of the pearl crash is the best indicator in Gulf history to mirror a crash 
how a crash would look like for an economy predominantly dependent on one source. In evaluating the three cases, there were three main factors that influenced institutional development. One striking factor is the diversification of trade due to their geostrategic locations in the pre-oil era. The second one is British involvement in domestic politics. And the third is the interplay between revenue extraction apparatuses and main players of revenue producers. The common thread among all three of these variables is the role that the merchants played in the outcome, the trajectory of institutional development. It's important to note, not all merchants were equal. The more dependent the merchants were on pearling, the less power they had in the political economy following the industry's crash. This has significant implications. A factor that distinguished Kuwait from Qatar and Bahrain is that its merchants have historically been and currently remain a stronghold in its politics. This can be partly credited to the fact that Kuwait had a trade economy that was less dependent on the pearling industry. It has a more diversified trade economy than those of Bahrain, Qatar, Bahrain and Qatar. Hence, the merchants had a more profound influence on domestic politics. Actually, as a result of merchant demands, the social contract of rentierism was formed to hedge against dynastic rule. The merchants of Kuwait benefited from their strategic location for three reasons. Kuwait's port was situated in uh, between two main ports, the one of Basra in Iraq and Bushahir in Iran. And the trade route of caravans traveling to and from uh, Aleppo and Baghdad. What is unique about Kuwait's ports is that it was outside the control of the tariff boundaries of the Ottomans. Together, all of these factors set Kuwait being a destination for trade. It connected the merchants to networks throughout the region, consequently giving them an outsized influence relative to their neighbors. In the pre-oil era, the domestic politics of Kuwait remained consultative, largely due to the influence held by the merchants. In the pearling area, the level of consultative relationships did decrease when Mubarak al-Sabah, commonly referred to as Mubarak the Great, consolidated power. Yet the merchants managed to stronghold him to secure favorable policies. To exemplify this, in protest to Sheikh Mubarak's tax policy, the merchants left, Bah left Bahrain and forced Sheikh Mubarak to personally get them back to return, which uh, is very unique. Although um, setting up a formal uh, taxation system in Kuwait institutionalized the extraction of money for the government, the merchants were able to set terms, their terms due to their economic power. Their relationship with the sheikhs prompted the state to create institutions, but there were also some that were solely merchant initiated that pushed their interest. For example, they created the Kuwait mun municipality in 1930, which was actually an elected body led by the merchants and played a role in domestic politics. Another important creation um, for the merchants was the education system, uh, which they, uh, they actually, actually in the 19, early 1900s, education just focused mainly on religious studies and um, the merchants decided to, to create and expand the curriculum. Therefore, they raised funds privately and established the first official school in Kuwait, which was in 1912, um, in Bar in, uh, it's in Barkia School. Um, it was actually strategically named after Sheikh Mubarak, but really controlled by the merchants. They also established an education council uh, to supervise and, development and develop the school system and they did the same for the health system as well. Through these institutions, the merchants of Kuwait lobbied their interest, a movement that was significant, significant in setting a precedent for institutional development across the Gulf was the 1938 movement coined as the Majlis movement. The emergence of this movement across the Gulf has been portrayed as a reaction to the merchants' fear of losing influence in the wake of the discovery of oil in 1938. Upon this realization, the merchants made their demands, arguing that revenues from oil should be earmarked for development rather than wastefully becoming income for just the sheikhs. The concept of rentierism and existing social contract emerges here, 
I believe this is a critical juncture uh, for the establishment of the existing social contract. In 1938, in the 1938 movement, the merchants organized politically through the very institutions that they helped to establish. They leveraged their newly established education council and the Kuwait municipality to push for a legislative assembly. They were able to establish a short-lived majlis that quickly fell apart due to the sudden shifting alliances with the British from the merchants to the sheikhs. During the 1938 movement, originally, the merchants managed to ally themselves with both the British and the local dis dissidents, isolating the rulers and initiating elections for a majlis. Majlis is a, um, like a legislative body, just to translate. However, the 1938 National Assembly was short-lived as the British withdrew their support and the sheikhs got together and consolidated the power into a dynastic mo monarchy and closed the Medlis in 1939. This was incredibly important um, in the political moment of Kuwait because you see the shift to a dynastic rule where the family um, held, tried to hold on the different institutions of power. And arguably, I mean, I think this influenced the whole Gulf region in my humble opinion. Also, it is important to highlight one key dissident that allied himself with the merchants was Sheikh Abdullah Salem, who later in 1950 became the emir and under his rule established the first national assembly in 1963, which uh, is in existence today. Meanwhile, the merchants changes, merchants changes implemented in the window of opportunity that occurred at the forefront of oil's discovery cannot be ignored. They set a precedent by creating the first Kuwaiti political bloc, the national bloc. Today, there are many different blocs in Kuwaiti politics, as you know. Um, the bloc restructured the tax system, introduced public health regulations, opened schools, reformed the judicial system, and began building the modern Kuwait. Kuwait politics has never been the same since then. As for Bahrain, of all the Gulf ports, Bahrain had the most important and active pearl trading port in the pre-oil era. This allowed the pearl trading merchants to be a powerful segment within Bahraini society. The tribal merchants, mainly uh, in the pearling industry, held power and at times even challenged the states. They had great autonomy and established vertical integration of the industry, including insourcing security. While the urban merchants were highly susceptible to, to the state and its decisions, that relationship actually flipped later. The same element that gave the tribal merchants their strength also proved to be their greatest weakness. In the 1930s, the pearl industry crashed and they quickly fell out of power. Amidst the implosion of the pearl industry, the urban merchants, many of whom were pearl traders, but also landlords and money lenders, were able to weather the transition due to their more diverse income sources. Although the urban merchants, unlike the tribal ones, were not as autonomous and were, ab were unable to evade taxation, through the payments of taxation, they became more empowered. They found opportunities in state-created institutions to lobby their interests, the change in this economic context caused a redistribution of power and allowed for the expansion of bureaucratic apparatuses. Like Kuwait, to a certain degree, through state institutions such as the municipal councils, the merchants of Bahrain contested power. In this context, the urban merchants obtained control of the municipal council and were able to increase their influence. The council allowed for the uh, merchants to protect their investments and hedge themselves against the harsh economic climate of the 1930s. The Majlis movement, which spread from Kuwait, had a domino effect across the Gulf and was adopted by the urban merchants in Bahrain. It was through this movement that the merchants lobbied for the creation of, the, of a council of elites, which again is like a uh, legislative body, in order to increase their influence on the state. However, in the end, the Bahraini merchants were not able to establish their legislative assembly until 1973, which got dissolved in 1975, and then was reinstated in, in 2002. Similar to Kuwait, but to a greater extent, 
One factor that caused Bahrain's failure to create a consul consultative majlis from the other Gulf states was the heightened British involvement in the island's internal politics. Charles Belgrave, a political agent of the British, had a direct hand in shaping state leadership and the development of Bahraini institutions. He saw it against the British's, the British's interest to allow the creation of any entity that would be equivalent to a parliament. Arguably, had it not been for the British, it is highly likely that Bahrain's National Assembly would have been first founded in the 1930s. The case of Qatar differed from Kuwait and Bahrain in that there was very little diversification from the pearling industry. This had a domino effect on the economy's institutional development in the pre and post eras. The, the location of Qatar lacked the strategic advantages of Bahrain and Kuwait and uh, due to that there was actually the merchants never really developed uh, a strong coalition. Additionally, there were other factors that affected them, like in 1783, some of the main players, some of the main merchants left to Bahrain for political reasons. Um, also, unlike Bahrain, Qatar didn't have a debt system where uh, the pearl divers were in debt to the merchants, so the merchants didn't have that level of power and leverage. Um, another distinction when compared to the other two countries is uh, the revenues uh, the, the government revenues were rooted in the pearl industry with less emphasis as the merchants as brokers. In this context, they had, uh, the merchants had lower bargaining power and uh, they were greatly weakened and there was actually no majlis movement in Qatar, which ironically, it didn't, it didn't happen in Qatar, but it did happen in Kuwait and uh, Bahrain. Um, the fact that the merchants were unable to create a bloc to negotiate with the rulers and that the leadership did not consolidate power through a taxation mechanism that could independently support the government meant that Qatar could, could make little progress in institutional development prior to the discovery of oil. And it's, it's interesting to know that the British didn't have a strong involvement in Qatar until 1950, and that's when the institutional development process happened. Today, not only is, it, is the social contract affected by the relationship sealed on the eve of oil, but also the institutions that affect the trajectory of private sector development. The existence of a strong merchant class in the pre-oil era had a grave implications for economic development trajectories. Today, Kuwait's merchants are strong and control a large part of the private sector, even though I believe the, the government is still stronger. Qatar, on the hand, other hand, has a government enterprise-based economy, whereas Bahrain is on the brink of reaching its status after the pearl industry crash, where the autonomous pearl merchants were facing the same challenge as the Bahraini government today as resources are running out. I know they discovered oil, but that hasn't come into fruition yet. Okay, um, the Bahraini government dependent on oil wealth has now turned to the business elite. And actually, if you look at the Chamber of Commerce now, uh, they, 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 the, uh, the business elite, they actually competed very viciously to get those seats because they know that it's, 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 their, it's their turn. Um, in the pre-oil era, Kuwait had the most diversified economy and Qatar the least, while Bahrain was in the middle. It is indis indisputable that their geostrategic location was a defining factor correlating with their respective levels of trade diversification. Similar to their level of diversification, there was an identical trend in the merchant's level of power as a political bloc. Another striking relationship appears when you evaluate these parliaments, which are vital institution for legislation on economic development. With the level of power they have relative to the level of power the merchants held in the pre-oil era, there is a clear trend in how the consultative relationship is driven by, mer driven by merchants reflects in their respective legislative bodies. Kuwait's merchants were on the forefront of creating institutions critical to state formation. I'm almost done. Um, before the discovery of oil, such as establishing an education system, healthcare, and distributive apparatuses. apparatuses. Yet commonly, it is identified that Kuwait, Kuwait's current state, state is also receding in its institutional development. Today it is evident that the merchants have a heavier hand in private sector development in Kuwait, while in Qatar, their development is more dependent on government enterprise, which is arguably 
more efficient in the case of Gulf economies. I'm going to go to my concluding points. In conclusion, um, dissecting all of this, there are key trends that can be derived here about how merchants set precedents for existing institutions. Where merchants exited, a different political economy emerged. That is reflected today, also evidenced in the legislative bodies. The merchant demands for oil wealth to be shared with the population set precedents for the social contract of today's gul Gulf frontier economies. The reaction of the interplay between the merchant and the government led to the establishment of dynastic leadership across the Gulf. And the Pearl Crash era offers critical insights with regard to the importance of economic diversification and the interplay of key players in the post-oil era. Thank you. Thank you, Dania, for a very informative presentation. Um, our fourth speaker, Dr. Qasim uh, Shaban, the linguist in uh, American University in Beirut. So his uh, subject will be linguistic transformation in the Arabian Gulf and its impact on local and regional identity. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm sorry I had, I'm going to speak in English. And I'll try to stick to time. Try. Uh, my introductory remarks is that I will start with People in the Gulf area have felt that there was no genuine development and innovation after years of independence and a huge expenditure. The reform initiatives. They cannot see it? It's not okay. 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 The reform initiatives that were taken whether in education or economics or socially, were always plagued by problems dooming, dooming them to failures. Localized rather than holistic and comprehensive planning resulted in meager outcome for enormous uh, efforts. Actually, in fact, if you look at one example would be the Arabic language, we always hear all kind of beautiful announcements. Al Majlis al Duali Lil Arabiya was established in Beirut in two thousand seven. They had one of the most ambitious plans. Year after year you could see they cut, they cut, they cut, and now it's just a celebratory event every year is held in Dubai. So we talk on a general level, but in fact we act locally, and since there is no coordination, we don't do a good job. There is failure of planners to control the contextual variables that could hinder implementation. One good example is what happened in Qatar with the education for a new era. It started really nice. It followed international benchmarks. However, the planners forgot that there are people who have to implement those beautiful plans. Teachers who are going to teach science and math in English, who themselves did not know English. Teachers who needed to be trained in the new curriculum, they were trained for a few days and then thrown into the market. In reality, what happened afterwards is a mess, and in, 2000, in 2011, there was the tests that were developed by the Higher Education Council, discovered that students were doing bad in English, doing bad in Arabic, doing bad in math, doing bad in science, and the government at the time took the decision to go back to Arabic. 
Uh, I will start by talking about the sociolinguistic diversity in the Gulf area. First of all, we have diaglossia, which me mainly means the presence of standard Arabic, modern standard Arabic, alongside the vernaculars in all the Arab countries. And then there is multilingualism, and this is here in the area amazing because it's not just Arabic and a foreign language, it's Arabic and many, many foreign languages spoken by the expats. Uh, there is also a tendency towards more diversification. I'm talking about new trends that we know of. There is a Gulf Pidgin Arabic developing. You know, pidgin is a reduced form of two languages, between two languages. And in the case of uh, the area here, it's mainly between the unskilled labor, because these people don't know English and don't, uh, haven't learned Arabic, and they have to talk to the locals. Uh, in Lebanon, something like that was called Madame Pidgin, because it's basically domestic help, and the, the uh, lady of the house gives the maid orders, do this, do that, only verbs and nouns, verbs and nouns. No more, no prepositions, no uh, adjectives, no adverbs, and so on. Uh, there are, there's also social media Arabic, which unfortunately is not even written in, in uh, Arabic orthography, it's written in Latin orthography, what people know as Arabizi or Franco-Arabic, uh, where even they have created for the Arabic sounds that are not found in English, they added numbers. And in addition you have the emoticons, the abbreviations, the borrowings, the code switching, so many things are happening in the sociolinguistic scene in this area. I start with standard Arabic. Despite the fact that many people think that standard Arabic has not changed, it's the language of the Quran, it hasn't changed much. In reality, it did change. Standard Arabic People still think of it as the language of the Quran, the language of pre-Islamic poetry, the language of science and philosophy in the Ma'moon's era and in Andalus, the language of media, literature, and social sciences after the 19th century Renaissance. Arabic, however, despite what people say and the, all the calls you hear about endangered language, the threats to Arabic from all sources, the conspiracies against Arabic. Arabic is still an official language in 23 countries. It's an identity symbol for young, young Arabs, and we did, I did review many research articles in which learners who are learning English or French as a foreign language, when asked about Arabic as an identity sy symbol, they showed great attachment to Arabic. They think of going into a foreign language only as a utilitarian practical move, but the symbol of identity would always remain Arabic. Uh, Arabic nowadays is a media language, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, even uh, France 24 and Sky and so on. There are so many satellite networks that use Arabic. However, it's not really 100% uh, standard Arabic. It is a mixed Arabic, and this part of the trend tendency, this part of the transformations that are taking place. Arabic is thriving in Islamic countries as a language of the Quran. People learn it as a second language in order to read the Quran and learn about Islam. Arabic also remains a pan-Arab language. If you go from the Gulf to Morocco and you have difficulty uh, communicating with them, you resort, you resort to standard Arabic. Arabic is a UN language, one of six UN languages. 
and Arabic is a foreign language in schools and universities all over the world. In the United States, after 9-11, the jump was enormous, like 15 times the number of students that they used to have before. So I think Arabic, despite all the calls we hear about its death and so on, is there to stay. Arabic vernaculars, that means the dialect, العامي, lahajat. These are language, this is the language of everyday communication and self-expression. If you get upset, it's easier to start shouting and screaming in your native spoken dialect. It is the native tongue of Arab children. Classical Arabic is learned at school. It's the working language in most Arab school classrooms, especially in the teaching of science and math that's supposed to take place in English or French. All studies done on what happens in the class, you have translanguaging, what we call translanguaging. And even actually in Arabic, in the teaching of Arabic grammar, teachers use the dialect. Language varieties with their own systems and they are not corrupted forms of the standard as people believe. The Arabic vernacular's vitality, they have evolved, developed, borrowed and created new terms and forms of expression. It, the, 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 the dialects are vital, they are essential and we need them. And in my opinion, they are not, there is no dichotomy like the diaglossia concept says. It's a continuum. Nowadays, there is a continuum. And I think the best example in the middle is educated Arabic, the language spoken on university campuses, for example, is a very good example of an Arabic that draws on both dialects and the classical. It serves new communicative functions in news media, reporting and commentaries in the entertainment industry and children, children's programs. So basically, what the vernaculars did, they took over some of the uh, functions of standard Arabic, but so did foreign languages. And again, as long as people separate these functions and don't think that Arabic is weakening, which it's not, I hope, then it should not be a big issue. We don't, shouldn't make big issues out of natural occurrences in any linguistic context. It's mixed with standard written work, such as poetry, plays, and fiction as part of a growing tendency all over the Arab world. You know, Najib Mahfouz used to write his dialogues in his novels in Egyptian Arabic. And this is becoming a tendency. I don't know whether you are familiar with this no really very good poet in Egypt, Hisham al -Jukh. He has poems, half in the dialect and half in classical Arabic, and it doesn't feel odd. The amazing thing, it doesn't feel odd, and people react in a really supportive way when he reads. Uh, Inter-Arab conflicts enhanced status of vernaculars as local nationalistic symbols. You know, we were talking about pan-Arab nationalism. We were talking before about a gulf, the development of a gulf economic union, of a gulf uh, linguistic standard. In reality, these, these attempts, I think, are failing. And we are going into, because of political conflicts, because of political conflicts, we are going into more disintegration, including linguistic disintegration. There's a paper by somebody who works at the institute here who talks about the revival of the, the, revival of the Qatari dialect, and it's partly as a reaction to what happens. Now it's, people would say what happened in 2017 is odd. It was not, it was not really odd anybody who was watching what's going on in the politics in the Arab world and in the Gulf in particular 
we'd notice that the undercurrents of conflicts, only they came to the surface all of a sudden. And we have now the, we have all these, all these uh, differences and all these nationalistic tendencies at the level of each country. So instead of pan-Arabism, pan-Gulf, we are going into local nationalism, and I think in the long run it's really dangerous for the, all the Arab world. Uh, Arabic and identity, in the old days, Arabic was the main element of identity. I heard the French Orientalist Jacques Burke says Arabic, the Arabic language is the identity of the Arabs. And Dr. Sleiman, Yasser Sleiman, is famous for his excellent writings on Arab nationalism and the role of the language in it. Uh, Using English as EFL and more recently as EMI, English as a medium of instruction, is bound to cause a devaluation of Arabic in the eyes of its speakers or an outright rejection, outright rejection of EMI as was the case in Qatar. Uh, the language failed as an identity the Arabic language has always been the main pillar of identity. I think it has failed. And I think religion has failed as identity. Ethnicity has failed as an identity because we all know the tribes, the same tribes, roam all over the area. And now they cannot even see each other between one country and another. Uh, the problem with Arabic lies in the policies or lack thereof that would protect, reform, and strengthen the role of the language. I want to move into conclusions. The absence of clear and balanced language policies could result in poor academic achievement of learners in schools and universities. And really, there are no clear policies. We start well, we mainly because we copy from the West. We have, everybody talks about standard base, everybody talks about benchmarking, everybody talks about learning outcomes, but on the ground, we are where we started like 30 years ago. Keeping Arabic as a medium of instruction for humanities and social sciences only is a great disservice to a language that has in the past preserved and developed the human scientific heritage. Not just preserved, but also developed. The private sector should not be, be prevented from using foreign languages in education and communication, but it should at the same time show a commitment to the use and development of Arabic as the language of the land. Arabic needs more than lip service from scholars and policy makers. What is needed is active engagement in reforming and modernizing the language through serious revival and implementation of the original plan of Arab language academies. If you read the original, the original mission of Majami' al al Arabiya, they sound beautiful. None of these, none of what they said has been put into, actually instead of one Arab language academy, now we have eight or nine. Initiatives to enhance the status and role of Arabic throughout, uh, sorry, through Though commendable, need to be more inclusive, comprehensive, and applicable in the real world. References, and thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Qasim. Uh, my first uh, specialty is applied uh, linguistic. Uh, we still have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, we open the floor for questions. Uh, we take any questions if there are any. So let us see who has the microphone. Okay. 
ممكن تعرف بنفسك و Please introduce yourself and then ask you a question. First of all, Muhammad Al Hashmi, PhD student. لكن أولا ببدأ بكومنت ليش عهود أنت قلت لنا استمتعت جدا في مؤثرة. You said you enjoyed this lecture very much. دكتور علي. كلهم. أنا كنت محظوظ أكثر لأن دكتور علي قبل من سبع أو ثمان سنوات لقيت كلاس عنده وكنت محظوظ كل أسبوع ثلاث ساعات. كنت أدرس عنده سنتين في الجامعة. He actually empowered me to develop and he empowered me to motivate me. دكتور علي شكرا. عندي سؤالين معلش. I have two questions. I know that. I know that. I know that. Very interesting presentation, um, uh, very interesting also analysis, and, and very interesting. Uh, you mentioned a lot of interesting points about the, the relationship uh, between the merchants and, uh, and uh, the leadership, we can call them in Kuwait. My question to you is, can we consider this relationship and the, the, the prosperity that uh, resulted after this relationship as a form of crony capitalism or, or not in Kuwait? And my second question, very quickly, is uh, to uh, the last uh, presenter. Uh, do you think that uh, um, the decline of Arabic language as a lingua franca between foreigners in countries like Qatar also contributed in minimizing the role of Arabic or at least weakening its uh, presence? Thank you very much. علي بعمل لك رياضة. شكرا. Thank you so much. I followed the three or four presentations. I'm very happy with what I listened to. What I followed. I'd like to thank the Arab Center for hosting this great platform to talk about identity. So I want to make a point about. The Arab lang Arabic language uh, with Dr. Kassan. Actually, those uh, deserving the Arabic language uh, are actually the elite, uh, and they are uh, themselves. They are talking or speaking English or French, uh, and they are proud uh, talking with their children in a foreign language. We see also that uh, the Europeans uh, are competing to open centers and institutions for teaching uh, Arabic. The uh, foreign minister, not Sweden, I think he means uh, Austria. So we saw a lot of uh, Westerners and Orientalists uh, speaking Arabic. So I think. Uh, it's uh, strange uh, to say that we're using uh, a dialect uh, to use in WhatsApp uh, and on social media. I think this is a big mistake uh, and we need to go back uh, to our language uh, because the French uh, forbid to show any movie in French uh, cinemas in another language uh, different from French and also the menus are written in the restaurants are written in uh, Arabic uh, and uh, even English it's uh, written in very small and tiny letters the French uh, president uh, as he spoke I think uh, in front of the EU he spoke in a uh, different language than uh, English. Uh, he was dismissed uh, immediately. But uh, actually, we as Arab countries, we send uh, delegates uh, who speak a foreign language uh, in international uh, platforms such as the UN and so on. So we need uh, to s stress uh, the importance of the Arab language. Assalamu alaikum. I want to add something to what Dr. Ali said earlier. He spoke about uh, the GCC uh, citizen after hundreds of years. Uh, 
Dr. Ali spoke about uh, the future of uh, GCC citizens. Uh, he said that uh, GCC citizens uh, will queue up uh, to apply for a visa to go to Bangladesh uh, in 1,200, uh, so it's around 1,852. One of the scientists in Oman, he said, There was uh, a draw at that time, and uh, for and upon that, uh, there were 50 men who left one city and they went uh, to India. So I think that this is uh, normal. We need to view it as uh, something normal in life. Uh, we should not uh, uh, prevent uh, people from moving, and I think it's not a shame to go to another place uh, to look for work or for better opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much. Two quick uh, questions. First uh, goes to Dr. Ali. <coughs> the diversity and the pluralism you spoke about in Doha or in GCC countries, uh, have a lot of nice uh, aspects uh, and uh, some of them were present in your uh, uh, discourse. Uh, but. Uh, There is also an opposite uh, side, there is expansion and uh, demography. So, so the, the more demographic pressure we have uh, in GCC series, uh, the more or the higher the towers uh, will get uh, and the more people you will need uh, also. To, uh, this is creating also a demographic uh, problem and uh, actually uh, this issue is not uh, discussed uh, and uh, maybe uh, specialists and experts uh, avoid uh, to discuss uh, this uh, topic. Uh, so if you can uh, comment on this. Uh, Dr. Qasim, if you can please comment uh, on uh, a big uh, gap uh, or irony or paradox uh, to provoke uh, Mr. Mesfer, but with all the due respect uh, to our beloved uh, doctor. The region of uh, GCC may be the only region in the world and maybe in the universe, uh, if we admit that uh, there are some populations elsewhere. And uh, if you go to Romania, for example, you learn Romanian to work and study. If you go to Argentina, you need to learn the local language. <coughs> this is maybe the only region where you, in the world where you can come. You don't need to learn the language. You can stay here maybe 10, 20 years, and you haven't learned the language. Maybe you, you, after 20 years, you can say, Ole Salaam Alaikum. That's it. <coughs> Thank you very much. My question is about uh, the city, Dr. Mahran and Dr. Ali. The impact uh, of the quick transformation of uh, GCC cities and its uh, impact uh, on uh, identity. And also what Dr. Khaled said, uh, the topography and the migration, the domestic migration, not only the uh, migration from outside, from abroad. Uh, I'm talking here about uh, uh, the exodus, for example, from uh, villages uh, to the cities uh, and the uh, domestic uh, migration. So our countries are actually have become countries of sta cities and not cities of countries because maybe uh, Dubai is much more famous than uh, UAE or Doha is much more famous than Qatar as name or Muscat and so on. So a change of one city is affecting its picture internationally. Uh, 
and all this is uh, related uh, to domestic uh, migration uh, and this uh, brought about a change of uh, the identity in GCC area. Rafi Attalai from Oman, but live in Qatar. A question to Dr. Mahran. I don't know. Shall I speak Arabic or English? How? How do you describe GCC countries in one word? Do you think they are modern or traditional societies and why? Dr. Ali, a great presentation. And the post identity or beyond the identity, it's a great idea. We need to think about it actually. Because. Uh, um, you spoke about uh, diversity and pluralism, but uh, can you tell us uh, how are we going to look like? Uh, are we going to look like USA or uh, another provocation of Dr. Qasim, a big uh, paradox? Uh, Dr. Qasim spoke about uh, English and uh, he was uh, uh, talking about uh, Arabic. So what uh, made him uh, uh, talk uh, in English about uh, Arabic to provoke you, I think? <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, all the uh, panelists and speakers. I have two commands. The first one uh, relates to identity. So I don't know the details of the papers, uh, but there is also always a polemic uh, and a controversial discussion related to identity in the GCC, its presence and uh, its uh, texture and uh, its uh, established if we uh, want to compare with other countries such as uh, Syria and uh, Iraq. Uh, I think uh, they are leading the situation of uh, the identity and the presence uh, of GCC societies uh, which uh, uh, think that they have uh, the same uh, tradition, the same culture, the same language and uh, religion. So for me, they are very much advanced, uh, regardless of the uh, uh, demographic uh, components, uh, talking about labor and so I think uh, these are only uh, reason for a short time. Uh, the second uh, issue relates uh, to uh, the way we study cities. I think this is something uh, quite uh, uh, difficult. First of all, we need uh, to define the ideal, ideological and the urbanization level uh, of uh, every uh, person. Dr. Ali showed us uh, uh, Daphna and West Bay and uh, he spoke about uh, urbanization in uh, Qatar. But you might have a Marxist uh, who comes and asks you, well, why you didn't go to the industrial area? The industrial area has uh, m many more people and they are actually the those who are producing in the country and they are providing the added value for the country. So before studying the city and uh, Dr. Sassan and uh, Juan Yuel Castan and all the contributors who studied uh, urbanizations, uh, we need uh, to define what is that uh, city and I have a quick uh, remark. I want to talk about uh, social ecology, microphone. And I think social ecology is important uh, for us to study uh, the situation of GCC cities uh, because uh, the starting point uh, is uh, comparison uh, between uh, uh, him being and his uh, environment, uh, social, envi environmental, uh, uh, social and uh, cultural environment. Uh, for example, uh, in Qatar, 
if you go to Vilanji, there was a comment uh, on the, the language. But when you go to Vilanji, you found it's Italian, but uh, in the middle of uh, the desert, you go to uh, the Pearl, uh, you find it something different. So the uh, urbanization logic is. Uh, is in contradiction with its uh, environment uh, and this is a very uh, sensitive uh, this uh, means a destruction for the culture for different uh, uh, aspects I have uh, three quick uh, questions to Mahran, Dr. Ali, Dr. Mahran. يعني فقط عايز أعرف the political impact of this uh, regional hub. Is there any political impact of a city like Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Doha to have political influence in the Gulf? So because you didn't touch upon this, I'd like to drag you back to your main field of political science. Dr. Ali, كالعادة مدخل ممتاز وأكثر من رائعة. The great presentation is usual. So you spoke about the uh, economic and social dimensions. Uh, your approach uh, is uh, you're, you're looking, uh, you're talking about the aspects uh, from above. Uh, can you uh, talk about the social stratification? What is the human being? Uh, with regard to all these changes and transformations, uh, those uh, living in the gated uh, communities are actually uh, normal uh, uh, classes. Dr. Qasik was uh, Ayinarik. I think you have, there are some reasons why you spoke in English. Uh, we always uh, link uh, identity with the language, but the language is not normally foundation of uh, the identity but uh, my children might uh, speak uh, English uh, but uh, they are loyal to their identity of course uh, the language uh, is important but uh, uh, seeing uh, the language as the unique uh, dimension of identity I think this is a problem I think time is over I came with a different uh, concept uh, to this uh, gathering. The first uh, shock came from Dr. Mahran. Uh, he spoke uh, in his uh, books about uh, society, but today he focused about the cities, about construction, and uh, we did not focus uh, on the human being. So, of course, there are a lot of transformations in the GCC. Uh, area. For example, today we didn't talk about uh, three important uh, problems, uh, and uh, these uh, problems have become a really a big uh, burden. So we spoke about the Shia, Sunnah, uh, villages, and uh, cities, uh, and this is uh, influencing uh, the uh, or impacting the situation in the GCC area. I invite you to. Uh, deep dive uh, into these uh, problems should not talk uh, only about construction and material uh, and uh, I think uh, we spoke uh, enough about this uh, issue during the last uh, 30 years so therefore I think uh, we need to focus uh, now on the human being we need uh, to activate uh, act, uh, activate uh, anthropological studies actually last question what is Hassan from Qatar University? Quick uh, comment regarding the first uh, presentations uh, with Dr. Mahran and Dr. Ali. I see that there is a kind of uh, discrepancy between uh, urbanization and uh, identity. Uh, it's something different than globalization and global city and regional rural. Are we trying to protect uh, our uh, identity through urbanization? Are we thinking uh, uh, about the era which is beyond the identity? 
So is this uh, the future we are aspiring for? Uh, I want to mention uh, one of one version of ver verse of the Quran, uh, which means uh, uh, Allah is uh, calling on people uh, to go in different uh, areas in the world and to explore different uh, areas uh, in the world uh, and uh, to look for opportunities and not to be related to a specific uh, place or location. Question to Dr. Qasim, the idea of language and also its importance uh, and uh, teaching it uh, in universities. Uh, the fact of uh, adopting the language, uh, the Arabic language uh, as the official language, but if uh, the scientific production nowadays is not uh, in uh, Arabic, uh, so you need to learn other languages. If we don't have uh, translation services in Kibli, how can we use uh, those uh, publications and references? Uh, so we are relying on uh, foreign uh, sciences, uh, and these are available only in a foreign language. Uh, last question to you, Doctor. You spoke about the relation between the, the societies uh, in the pre-oil era and also their relation uh, with uh, the uh, leadership. Nowadays, uh, what is the relationship uh, between these parties? There is a large uh, part which is very important. There are a lot of uh, uh, global dimensions, and these uh, dimensions are impacting the institutions we establish nowadays. So I didn't see the uh, uh, foreign intervention in this uh, process. Uh, the process of uh, establishing institutions. You spoke about uh, uh, England uh, maybe one time or two times, but I don't think that this really had a big impact. All right, thank you. Very quickly, domestic migration within the GCC. Historically, uh, Middle East uh, cities have been very segregated along uh, ethnic, religious, and tribal lines, uh, and uh, uh, GCC cities have been no exception. What we're seeing as a result of choice as a result of government policy and economic preferences is in, in the GCC and integration of the city. So for example, you have some neighborhoods in which some uh, tribes are concentrated within the city or some extended kin group, but they also have second residences. They have uh, uh, a villa in uh, one of the reclaimed land areas or they have a uh, an apartment in a tower. So that's a really good, uh, good point. Uh, the question about modernity and tradition, um, I think in some ways that binary doesn't necessarily hold in relation to the GCC, modernity and tradition. There is some sort of hybrid identity that is emerging. Um, because GCC countries are so easy to govern because of demographic size and uh, the fabric of the political system, uh, I think in many ways state leaders have been able to play a very uh, influential and consequential role in shaping people's identity. And so, for example, we see public art, Katara, uh, elsewhere, uh, and, and um, identity here in the region has been subject to dynamics that are different, for example, uh, in places like Egypt or Iran or uh, elsewhere. Um, um, social ecology, I, there was a uh, di discussion about social ecology. I think that's quite important. Yes, uh, uh, one's relationship with their surrounding environment tends to be uh, very important. Um, and uh, uh, there was the c a very important question about the political impact of regional hubs. When I actually started doing this research, that's, the, that's what drove me. Uh, to look at the uh, cities because uh, 
uh, up until 2013-2014, Qatar was trying to shape the destiny of the region. Then after 2015, it was Abu Dhabi that now see, see, thinks they can shape the destiny of the region. So there's this hubris, this sense of uh, false pride that comes with these big buildings where political leaders think they can shape the destiny of a country like Egypt or Syria or, or Iraq or now Yemen or whatever. The problem is that these countries become subject to their own uh, false pride and so either they discover that they cannot get involved in Syria and Libya and they need to back down or, uh, and, or they get caught in the quagmire that is uh, today's Yemen. So I think you ask a very important question. Dr. Khaled pointed to the importance of the human dimension. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, but uh, uh, that of course is important. But I think it's also important to ask, what does Doha mean 50 years from now? Is it going to be an empty shell or is it going to be a, con uh, is it going to be a regional hub? Is, what does Abu Dhabi mean? What does the UAE mean? in terms of larger human, uh, human history. I think the point, the question that you point to is incredibly important, but I think there are other, uh, uh, other dimensions. And then the discrepancy between urbanization and identity. Um, uh, are we uh, uh, protecting identity through urbanism? Uh, this is, I think, very important because in the 2000s, uh, in the 1990s and the 2000s, there was this wholesale embracing by local policymakers and local rulers of whatever was modern. Uh, then, now there's been a rediscovery of tradition. Actually, it's a reinvention of a politically influenced interpretation of tradition. So, for example, we have the Desert Rose that now symbolizes the Qatar National Museum. Now, I think there's a legitimate question to ask, to what extent does the Desert Rose represent Qatari tradition, heritage, culture? But somebody somewhere decided that it does. And so I think, yes, there, uh, I think you ask a very, very important question. Uh, and, and I think that is also something that I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues from Oman, uh, Dr. Khalid, Dr. Aisha, Dr. Rafia, Dr. Rafiq, I thought uh, the main objective uh, and the backbone of my paper presented uh, with the collaboration of Hadil, we want to go uh, beyond the fact that the city is only about places and locations. Uh, we wanted to talk about a human being. That's why I spoke about uh, the, the, the topic of beyond the identity. We found out in the recent years, especially in the last year, that the local identity is collapsing. The uh, regional GCC identity is uh, getting apart. Uh, and we cannot uh, keep up uh, and catch up uh, with the international identity. And also the Islamic identity is undergoing a big uh, crisis. Uh, another important di uh, dimension, when we say that GCC countries uh, have 10 or 15 percent locals and uh, 85 or 10 or 90 percent expat, the paper rejects this uh, uh, analysis uh, because this is uh, against uh, the identity. We need to go beyond uh, dividing the GCC society into a local or a citizen and uh, an expat. Uh, I think uh, this uh, division might be accepted somehow now, but in the future this won't be acceptable if we want uh, to see a real future for GCC cities. The paper is not uh, superficial, uh, it's not talking only about the image of the city, it's not a visual, sit uh, visual picture alone, 
that it focuses on different things. Uh, I spoke about the uh, public uh, spaces in Bahrain, uh, how these uh, public spaces uh, become uh, a uh, traffic uh, complex or uh, problem uh, for the way we deal with uh, uh, labor because we know that they are in the region of only on temporary basis. Uh, therefore, we call through this uh, paper to put an end to this situation of uh, none uh, pertaining to the country. So you can uh, reside here 5, 10, 20 years, and uh, your suitcases are always ready if you want to leave. And this uh, can never give you a feeling of uh, belonging to that area. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, first of all, I spoke English. Uh, as you say, you saw. So I didn't know that I can choose uh, uh, a language for my presentation. So all uh, my communication with the center was in English. That's why I uh, uh, I said that, uh, yes, uh, I can speak uh, English. And when I was preparing this paper, uh, at the end of the paper, I discovered that I could have written this also in Arabic, but that was too late. So my position says that we really need to use uh, Arabic uh, as uh, in education, as a language of culture, civilization, but uh, I cannot uh, turn my back uh, to reality. There is a general feeling among people, among all people which says if you want to see your children in good positions and to gain good knowledge, so they need to study in English. And there was a test conducted in Beirut in the Association of al Makassad. The responsible started teaching sciences in Arabic and the experiment uh, took uh, 10 years after 10 years uh, they stepped back uh, from that uh, experiment although the results uh, were 100% uh, for the Arabic language and Tamam Salam uh, he was the uh, director of the association uh, he uh, held a press uh, conference and he said uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, the most difficult decision I took in my life uh, we used the Arabic language and the usage was uh, very successful, but uh, we lost uh, half of our students and uh, we shut down uh, more than 25 schools alone in Beirut. So there are a lot of uh, facts and uh, on the ground. As we heard uh, repeatedly, the families uh, or the parents uh, reject uh, to teach uh, their children Arabic. Uh, and they are uh, proud to talk with their children in English or in any foreign language. This is a situation of language. Uh, they know that teaching uh, children in a foreign language, of course, uh, this has a lot of impact uh, on uh, the social uh, classes. This is also against the uh, logic uh, because we know that uh, wealthy children they go to elite schools which uh, focus on using foreign languages uh, and uh, poor or vulnerable uh, uh, classes go to different schools uh, of course there are a lot of uh, uh, disparities and discrepancies in this uh, regard uh, and this uh, might lead also to a revolution then the we witnessed uh, also a lot of revolutions because of uh, economic uh, situation. And regarding uh, identity and the impact uh, of uh, language, so I'm not linking uh, identity with the language alone. Uh, uh, identity is related to different factors, and among them is the language and the race, uh, religion. Uh, 
also the common history, the aspirations or the common aspirations. If society is divided at the level of its uh, aspirations uh, because of the current situation, this is not going to help uh, the issue of the language. How shall we teach Arabic? Well, this is what uh, I spoke about. If we go back uh, to the Majma'a uh, al Arabiya, which is the uh, Ac Arabic Academy, or the Academy of the Arabic Language, so they were looking for translating uh, sciences. The same what happened uh, as what happened in the era of Al Ma'mun and uh, in Andalusia. The, the Spaniards uh, were coming or going uh, to churches to learn Arabic and uh, to read the books uh, in Arabic, uh, books about. Uh, different uh, sciences uh, and uh, some uh, of uh, the Arab intellectuals uh, are actually responsible for the translation uh, movement and they are translating you know uh, trivial uh, uh, issues they are not uh, translating what society needs uh, so they speak about translation yes translation is important the other issue is uh, we need uh, to encourage uh, writing in this uh, maybe this is helpful only when there is an award to get the Sheikh Zayed award or uh, uh, King Faisal uh, award and so on I think uh, we need to do more for example in Qatar after going to Arabic there is a project and I hope uh, that it's gonna be successful in uh, Qatar University uh, many professors uh, who are teaching uh, international uh, relations and uh, management uh, they were asked to uh, write and publish uh, in Arabic I was uh, serving in uh, Qatar University and I asked uh, a computer science professor why you are uh, teaching in English? Uh, he said the last uh, book, uh, we, the last book uh, about uh, Arab, about international relations uh, was in Arabic uh, and that was in 1980. So we cannot still use the same book uh, for 2018. Therefore, Qatar University asked uh, the, its professors to write uh, and publish uh, books. Uh, And the uh, management said, uh, yes, if the uh, students uh, want to have uh, publications in English, we can have it, uh, but we can have like a uh, uh, two level. <coughs> one is Arabic and the other one is uh, English. Uh, you know, also in Qatar, a lot of families, they don't like to go back to the Arab language uh, as uh, education medium so they prefer that their uh, children go for uh, English um, okay to answer some of the questions which I only got to but um, is the relationship between the merchants and the state have some uh, element of crony capitalism yes undeniably um, but the level varies from country to country even though it's omnipresent. Um, uh, there's also an, uh, a point that I would like to make is it's not necessarily good or bad. I mean, there's some good elements that came out of the relationship of the merchants and the state, and there are also some negative ones. I mean, Kuwait is a prime, prime example that um, in, in that era, it was a very, actually Kuwait was very influential and um, whatever role the merchants played did spread throughout the region. However, today, as I mentioned, Kuwait's institutions have kind of res rescinded in development, um, even though the merchants do remain very strong. And one striking um, 
uh, case that was very interesting for me when looking at this. All the way in the Asia Pacific, um, Japan, after the World War, uh, was devastated. And uh, the merchants, the merchant, the, the equivalent of a merchant class there, were completely eliminated. And um, what happened was they were on the forefront of innovation because, because there was not what you would arguably say crony capitalism. So it's not necessarily true that the existence of merchants mean that development is going to move forward in a progressive manner. Now when you look at Korea, which is a comparative country, the merchant class is there. And um, Korea did develop uh, very well as well as an innovative economy, but not to the extent of, of Japan, arguably. So uh, now the same thing you can come back and look at Qatar and Kuwait. Uh, Qatar and Kuwait uh, have a different uh, domestic political landscapes. And you see that the, the merchants play a stronger role in Kuwait and they don't as much in Qatar. I mean, Qatar has developed very well. I mean, right now on the global st stage. But Kuwait, you know, obviously has its place in among the Gulf countries to be on the forefront of development and um, a lot of issues. And uh, one of them is, 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 is freedom. Um, so, I mean, like I said, it's, it's in between, it could be good or it could be bad. Depends on which angle you look at it. Um, and then um, you asked me about the relationship between these parties uh, and the global dimensions. I mean, this was actually from a broader project, so I was really focusing on the historical aspect. Um, from the global perspective and the historical aspect, obviously the British played a huge role in shaping the institutions. And you see different levels of, of, of their um, participation in this process. Uh, and th they were very involved in, in Bahrain, less involved but still involved in Kuwait and absent in Qatar. And that made a huge difference also in their institutions. Um, in reference to a global role today, I mean, if you look at some of the merchants, certain multinational companies do give certain merchants uh, uh, exclusive access to certain brands of cars and other other things and that does affect uh, their economic power and leverage um, and it, I guess it depends on who's giving them access to those multinational brands and that 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 will shape like the trajectory of how things develop based on that at the end, I'd like to thank uh, all the uh, speakers and panelists. I'm sorry if we took uh, uh, more time than expected. Like, uh, and I wish you a very nice uh, evening in Doha. Thank you.